Hello, Hayden Williams here. I'm back for season four of Man in the Mirror, the podcast where I talk to a male guest about their life, about work, about some of those key items on their bathroom shelf that they can't do without, and also about self-care, self-image, and the man that stares back at them in the mirror. Did you miss me? I took a, a short break in the spring just to, to refresh and recharge, find some new guests for the new season, so we're back and back and at it. So, yeah, if you haven't listened before, welcome. I think what I'm trying to do here is a sort of unique podcast where there's a male lens on fragrance, grooming, self-care, and, and things like that. So let's get into it. In this episode, I'm talking to Dan Williams, who's the MD of Profile PR. Now, I've talked to different people in the skincare and the grooming and the fragrance industries, whether they be founders, whether they be entrepreneurs, whether they be perfumers, whether they be journalists, all sorts of different people. But I haven't spoken to someone from the PR industry before, and it's obviously a really important part of the industry, that that kind of gatekeeper who works between the brands and the media and, and makes sure that the brands get coverage for their new products. It's a really interesting role, and it's a kind of interesting behind-the-scenes job. I've known... Dan for a good couple of years now and actually he was one of the, the first people I encountered in the sort of fragrance and beauty industry. He was really kind, really welcoming to a, a newcomer like me and um, he's, you know, fantastic stories, really personable, really fun and makes events go with a swing. So I thought he'd be a great person to get on to talk about PR and how it, how it works with fragrance and skincare and, and grooming. So Without further ado, it's Dan Williams, who's the MD of Profile PR. Now, you'll hear more in his chat, but um, Profile look after brands such as DS and Durga, and I've, I've spoken to David Seth Maltz, the perfumer and co-founder of DS and Durga before. He does juice box perfume brand, does citizen watches, lots of jewellery, Ellis Brooklyn, and, and previously Profile have done Creed, Byredo, Frederick Mild, people like that. So I hope you enjoy it. It's Dan Williams, and this is Man in the Mirror. Here we go. Hi, it's Hayden Williams here, and it's another episode of Man in the Mirror. And I've headed out of my home studio and this week, I'm at the office of Dan Williams, who is MD of Profile PR. Hi, Dan. How are you? Hi. I'm really good, thank you. Oh, really thank good. you so much for having me at your office and uh, making some time to do this this morning. You're I really appreciate it. Very welcome. Very welcome, welcome. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, on the podcast so far, I've chatted to, to various people, obviously some founders of businesses, um, perfumers, people in retail, people in, in branding and journalists. But um, I haven't spoken to someone in PR before and I thought it'd be a really interesting area to look at because obviously this podcast, you know, it covers some industry stuff around grooming and fragrance and skincare and things like that, but also you know, more broader topics. But I just think it's really, um, I'm really keen to sort of lift the lid on what people do and how they got to where they are. So... We'll certainly get in more into to how PR fits into the whole campaign and, and you know, the stuff that we see as consumers on the on the other end as you know fragrance lovers and and people who use grooming products. But how did you get into it, or was it something that you always wanted to do, or did was it more accidental? In all honesty, it was completely accidental. Was completely accidental. I mean, my upbringing, my background could not be further away from what I do right now. Where did you grow uh, up? I grew up in Wales on a tiny little a tiny little town called Tembe, uh, which is the sort of seaside town. Yeah, I thought all, it was this coastal, isn't it? Yeah, Tembe? yeah. So all very idyllic on a farm with 200 cows. So right. <laughs> I grew up as a, yeah, as a, you know, farmer's son. Did um, you think you'd stay involved with that and get into farming? Uh it, again, absolutely not. Uh, Did you know that quite early? I, I definitely, definitely knew farming was not where I wanted to be going, Hayden. As much as we do, do many early night, uh, many early mornings now, starting work, the early mornings of farming would have been an absolute killer. killer. What are we know. talking like five a.m. Oh, a. four o'clock down oh. in the milking parlour. Damn! If you have to do you know, milking 200 cows for the day you have to get there before the whole world starts. It was not for me. I mean, I look back and now it seems like a whole other lifetime, a different world ago. 
And it's lovely to go back to every so often. Have you got family who are in that yeah. part of the world still? Everyone's still down there. But um, in my head, all I knew was that I needed to get out of Wales. I needed to find more of my own kind. And, uh, and was that the lure of the big cities and was. the big smoke? And it was like, did you come yeah. to London? Or It was uh, me and a couple of friends we had always talked about. Like, all we wanted to do was, when we're sitting around the tables in school, was... We're going to move to London. We're, we're going to get go. out of we're here. We're going to go. It's, we've heard all about it. You know, the streets are paved with gold. All of that. <laughs> Had you been before? I mean, no. I would paint this picture that you were in some sort of rural area and you'd never seen London. I mean, maybe you'd, I'm sure you'd been. Mm. We'd come as, as with my grandparents and stuff when we were kids. And we'd always, as birthday treats, we'd always get on the coach and come to London with my nan and my aunties and have a nice wander around. To you see a show? We would come and see the show. We were very sheltered growing up. We mm. were happy to come to Trafalgar Square and feed the pigeons. <laughs> I mean, I think people are missing out a lot these days. It's innocent on pleasures. Not, yeah, on not seeing <laughs> the pigeons of Trafalgar Square. It was, um, yeah, the, the, the National Express bus and, you know, driving past Tower Bridge and or, or across Tower Bridge and past um, the Tower of London. Just, it felt really magical. So I just yeah. always, in my head, thought... That's where we want to go. That's where I wanted to end up. And did you have a notion of what you wanted to do? I had no idea. How old are you at this point? At this point, I'm probably still secondary school. Yeah, yeah. So a couple of our friends. I'm very proud. None of them made it to London. I was the only one. And they always said I was never going to get there. So I think I dug my heels in. Still here, baby. I'm still here and doing <laughs> all right. Dug my heels in and I was going to get there by hook or by crook. But yeah, even still then... I ended up here by accident. Was PR the first thing you found, or were there other jobs first? No, so, again, like, sort of, how I initially sort of moved out of Tembe is on a whim. We went night clubbing once and made friends and stayed. <laughs> Never went home. And then... Seriously, though? Yeah, yeah seriously. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we slept on some people's floors. This is... Yeah, so was this like go, late 90s? Or? This is going back 25 years. Mm. So, again, a whole other world. I yeah. wouldn't recommend it, but it's what you do. Different it's times. Different times, different simple times. pleasures. <laughs> and so, yeah, and I was in, I was living in Cardiff at the time. And again, at a nightclub. And There's a theme here, then. There is a theme. My life was a lot of nightclubbing back in the day. And... Um, you wouldn't even call it night clubbing these days, no, would you? I don't, I don't oh, think God. they do, do they? The young people. Yeah, and <laughs> uh, and I met someone. Yeah. And I came to London for love. It was, Did you? Yeah, it was. Yeah, three months of, of dating up and down the M4. Yeah, and, uh, as it were. Uh, yeah, and, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and I moved to London. And when I got here... I made it. I'd made it yeah. to London. It wasn't the way in which I thought or planned. But and what did you do when you first came here, uh, work, work-wise? So, I think like everybody, I just sort of got silly little temp jobs yeah. that got me... Paid your way. Paid yeah. the way yeah. and, and got me out of the house and got me meeting people. And then when I, me and my partner, who 25 years still together now, so, you know, it does work sometimes meeting in real life. So I wasn't sure whether that was your yeah, yeah, yeah. your front, yeah. but oh, amazing. Yeah, twenty five years, still the same person. Oh, I love that. Is that we were sitting down? And he was sort of saying, "What, what do you want to do? Look, you have this opportunity. You've, you know, you've left home, you've left Wales, you're here in London. What do you want to do?" And I think it was such a nice, you know, nice position to be in that somebody was there to help you and to guide you and give you those opportunities. To say, you can do do whatever you want to do. Yeah. What would you like to do? And I was just sort of stumped. I wasn't somebody who'd come from a, a huge sort of um, university education. I came to London, came to London with the clothes on my back and, and big ideas. <laughs> and a dream. And a dream. And, and I could talk a lot. Yeah. And that was... Which is, is a good was, skill for a, where you've... It's, ended up it's the star it's yeah. the start and the you know the the ability to actually communicate is mm. the main point of our job but the yeah. main point of our role so he was sort of said well he sort of said um i know somebody who's who has a pr company who just started up a pr company we'll have them around for dinner and introduce you and that was how i first met my first 
Well, my first boss. And was that in, profile? Yeah. And that was the original. An, another theme for this. I moved to London in one go, find one boss, and that was it. That's my first and only job in PR. But yeah. saying that, we had a couple of other friends who worked in the media industry as well. A friend of ours, she was the homes editor at the Daily Mirror. Oh, okay. So she said, look, Whilst you're working a day a week in this PR company, I'll employ you a day a week over at the Daily Mirror as well, and you can assist me in doing things. And which was really my first entry point into the world of media. Yeah. And so going to Canary Wharf and going to those those big offices of of the Daily Mirror and seeing it, it was, you know, as a 19 year old, it was really imposing. It yeah. just felt this is you know this is a big it's world. Big yeah. Yeah. Everyone all suited. I think even at the time, people were still smoking at their desks. Yeah, Hayden. they would have been. Oh, yeah. my God. It was terrifying. But my bosses were in the, in the 90s. Yeah, yeah people sitting, smoky offices. sitting around smoking in desks, yeah. looking at the back benches, all smoking on their desks. And I was sat with her in the home department, but I was also sat with this guy who was the uh, the TV editor at the time, Charlie Catchpole. And I, I remember his comments. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. And I would sit and help them. And... I would send back... Well, just tell them what stuff you were watching and what you thought. <laughs> what I thought, what was on TV at the time. But no, I was... My first ever role, and I remember it well. And this is why I always think people should never complain about first things, the things that they have to do when they first start in jobs, because everybody starts at from nowhere. You know, you all mm. have to start and learn and do every single role. I would always say that, you know, I still get involved in every part of PR right now, and I think everybody... You're never too too big or too yeah. important not to do all these things. And so my first role was just sitting, flicking through transparencies and putting them in little white cases and either sending them back to the PRs yeah. or sending them off to be reproduced. And, yeah, I look back on it now and we work with JPEGs and, and yeah. three now on... Just send it by email. Send it by email. Yeah. I had to get these little little negatives and put them in little plastic pockets yeah. Uh, and then I mean, it's the same envelopes. in um, sort of TV and film and stuff, isn't it? I remember, and I sort of did work experience in, in music, but there was this whole industry around Soho of people sort of walking or going around on bikes, just handing over, you know, beta tapes. And this, you know, yeah. ev everything was, I mean, sound, we sound ancient, but <laughs> we, we, all this sort of physical media of that period just required either. We have century. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it all required sending somewhere or taking somewhere and, and now we just take for granted that you just I know. press one button and it's there. I had a single roll pack fax machine <laughs> and that occasionally would get overheated and so everything that would come out of it would just be black. Um, <laughs> so you didn't know what anyone was ordering. People would send, you know, orders just for images over a fax and we had one computer... God, it does make us sound ancient. We had one computer that we, we shared... With like dial-up modem. With dial-up modem and that w with one email address that we would check twice a day, morning and evening. <laughs> and that was where we sort of started. But Listen to us old gits know, going God, on. Don't. But um, the work you were doing at Profile, and I should... Ex I mean, it's, maybe it's fairly obvious, but Profile were involved in fragrance and beauty right from the get-go, so you yeah. got immersed in into that world, right? So, yeah, my first ever boss and then in, and sort of work PR colleague, Michael Donovan, who I'm sure a lot of people who might be listening to this would all also know, who'd started up Profile, was working in sort of health and beauty. We did health and beauty and we also did luggage. We ran the gamut of, of products so from one thing to the other, but it was it gave you a good overview of lots of different areas you weren't just speaking to one set of people you were speaking to lots of people yeah. so you always got lots of different opinions and lots of ideas things would as weird as it sounds ideas would cross over from one thing yeah. to another and you're pitching products that would potentially go into sort of you know weekend supplements and, and monthly magazines you know, at this point it was all just yeah everything was just print yeah. so it was monthly magazines newspapers weekend supplements as you say so that was your sort of training ground. It was, yeah, it was, it was, you know, there was only a couple of us in the office, so yeah. it wasn't so much as a training ground as jumping in at the deep yeah, yeah. end straight away. Which is often the, the best way, though, isn't it? You have to sort of yeah. sink or swim. I was, you know, he trained me up really, really well. He taught me all the fundamentals and things that I still remember to this day is that... So what, what, what do you think those attributes are then that, that make, you know, you've been 
hugely successful. And now, you, you know, you run Profiles, you're, you're MD. What, what, what are those things that maybe you had innately anyway, but what, what do you think are the things that, that sort of make a good PR? Just being able to communicate. Yeah. We are, we're a service industry, and I think a lot of people forget that at the end of the day, is that it isn't just all... You know, sparkles and glitter and going out and night parties. Um, Not anymore, unfortunately, yeah. Hayden. Gone are those days. <laughs> I mean... It's typical of me. I came too late and never got, you know, the yeah. same with all my jobs. It's just people tell you with sort of wistful glances of, oh, you should have been here 10 years ago. You know, it should have been in Absolutely. music in the 80s. It was amazing. And now everybody, you know, oh, you should have been in, you know, do writing and doing stuff in Fragrance of Beauty 20 years ago. That's when it was brilliant. Oh, oh I'm too late again. It was great. It was... <laughs> you know, it, there was pl there's pluses and minuses for both sides of where we were, but it, back in you know when I first started, it was a lot of lunches. Yeah, you weren't getting anywhere with uh, with journalists or getting your features in a magazine unless you, unless you took them unless out. you'd taken people yeah. out and had a, a lovely lunch. Quite a long, busy lunch. ended up in you know some sort of drinks. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> but you know you've been in talking about that communication piece and um, you know the the attributes. I guess that's that's part of it as well, isn't it? That you've You've got to be a sort of sociable, or you, you've got to at least you know, yeah. have that quality where you can be sociable and entertain people. You, and you had to learn to you have to adapt yeah. to every situation, yeah. and you have to realise that every situation is not about you. Uh, you have to be able to communicate with a wide variety of people from different backgrounds, of different ages. Mm. I think you know I started when I was nineteen, and I was young and I felt mm. really young and at times do you think I, that was used against you know do you think that was a disadvantage I think in sometimes I thought it was a disadvantage I think I looked really young as well so I always had issues with yeah. looking very young but me and Michael were sort of we were you know he was a few years older than me we were sort of like a, a duo in that I was sort of younger and he was older so and you could cover off yeah whatever all sorts of people whatever situation yeah. but I think because we were such a small team and you had to, like you said, it was a sink or swim, you had to talk to everybody. Mm. So you had to be able to hold your own in every situation. Mm. And I think that that is where sort of my confidence came from a lot. Mm. I think a lot of it also going further back into my sort of personal life is that I did move around schools a lot as did well you? when I was growing up. I went to, before my parents split up, don't need to know all of this, but um, uh, no, I was with my my dad uh, was in the police force, so we right. moved all the time. I went to nine schools, right. so you had to learn to fit in yeah. at every different school, yeah. from schools in England to schools in Wales, and everybody in Wales hated the boy that came from England, and everyone in England hated the boy that came from Wales. So you had but to it's such a good skill, isn't it? That sort of chameleon-like ability to adapt to different yeah. situations, and and I think that that has helped me coming through into this yeah. career as well. It'd be great to know some of the, the brands that you were working with at that stage at Profile, you know, who were you working with in the early days? So, as I mentioned, it was we had a varied range of clients from, from luggage to health and uh, products and brands in the health and beauty uh, world. I think the first, one of the first companies that I ever worked with was we launched Neil's Yard Remedies. Ah, okay. He sort of, you know... Founders in the world of uh, natural health yeah. and beauty. And that was just so exciting. Working with the founder, of Romy Fraser, then at the time, who was just an incredible sort of fount of all knowledge. I mean, anything you need to know about any ingredient, any product, she knew everything and, and came at it from such a different angle than anybody else was doing mm. in that industry at that time. And it was so amazing to watch her builds that company. Yeah. And, and did you find it easy then to get coverage? Were people interested? It in had it had media? such a point of difference yeah. than anybody else. Everybody was interested to learn about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, they had those iconic blue bottles that looked amazing on a page. So it was one of the things that we always had to think about yeah, back in those days. The, the visual. What, how was it going to look on that page? Yeah. Was it going to fit in? But she had amazing products. I think the thing we were really proud of we were, uh, we were working with the launch of her anti-aging cream uh, frankincense nourishing cream and we'd sent it over to Cho Fairley mm. um, and she show. reviewed it so where was she working at that point it was for 
U Magazine. Right. I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, we're going back, it was U Magazine, the Daily Mail. Which of you ever got anything in the Daily Mail U Magazine at that time? It was banned down the hatches because it was going to sell out yeah. to those days. Yeah, yeah. And it did, and it went crazy, and it really put that brand... You know, there's so much about that brand that made it huge, but that was one of those things that really opened yeah. it up to the world and to the world of in PR to all the journalists. Everybody wanted it yeah. then. And so it really gave us a deal. hitting that kind of mass market audience, yeah. aren't you? And, and it has such a great story. Nobody was talking about natural products at their time. And, yeah. And it was anti-aging. Everybody, you know, it had been reviewed. It said it was turning back the clock. So, you know, you'd hit all your, all your, your PR touch points. The, yeah. the, somebody had written such a great review and it flying out so that was really exciting and what about fragrance brands? and then fragrances i was so incredibly lucky <clears throat> and when i look back on this now to even say the brands that i worked with originally just see as a first job seems so ridiculous as in the our first ever was one of the first ever fragrance brands that we worked with and launched into the uk was creed wow i mean yeah of of all the fragrance brands that you could work yeah. with in the world to, to as your first and to, to... And presumably they were much smaller then. Nobody right? knew them. Yeah. Like, literally, nobody had heard of this brand and we had to... We were working with it, launching in the UK, and how were we going to do it? It was... You know, at, at that time, everybody just pursued it. It was so much more expensive mm -hmm. than everything else that was <clears throat> on the market. And why were we paying this much money yeah. for... For a bottle of green Irish tweed, yeah. and so it was. It's like everything that we do in this industry. It's about educating the end consumer and explaining to them why why they need to part with their money. You know why aren't why aren't we buying you know the celebrity scent yeah. for fifty pounds that the yeah. we've always worn? Why are we moving from our Ralph Lauren polo? And what's, into yeah, why is it such a premium for yeah. something like this? Um, and so it was about it, and and it was, you know, it wasn't easy to start with, but once people got on board with that fragrance, they really, really got on board, and I mean, look at it now. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely massive. Um, you've but, got this really interesting role, I think, in, in PR, where the, you're obviously, you're working with, the you know, the client being the brand, but you've got to sit in the middle and then sell that brand to to the to the media and to yeah. the journalists, so you're this sort of interim person. You have to be able to interpret the brand's messages mm. in a way that is interesting and relatable to both the journalists, but then also to that end consumer. Yeah. Because sometimes things will come with stories and and a lot of background that you just know at the end is, is not going to translate right. so well. Right. So you have to either give your advice to the brand and, and say, look, this is what we feel would... How it, how the, how you could interpret this story well would be this, but at the end of the day, it is obviously it's always down to the brand, and we only will put out the information that they are comfortable with and happy with. I think going back to going back to sort of Creed just then is that what I remember one of the the big points of it and and how we really sort of initially broke, especially into the 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 across the sort of journalist world at that time is that fragrances were always male or female. Yeah. It was, you never crossed over. And I think that's a really exciting point where we're at now is that fragrances for everybody. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. completely genderless, wear what you want. But at that time it was. <clears throat> you had your men's fragrances and you had your women's yeah. fragrances. And for however it has happened, Naomi Campbell got hold of Green Irish Tweed and, and raved she, about it in in press and it was one of the first times that you heard about a woman wearing a man's fragrance yeah. and that was it everybody was didn't everybody Robbie Williams was like Green Irish they felt like at that time quite a few celebrities were talking about Green Irish I mean I, I think is, I'm going back a long time I think this is even even before then it yeah. hadn't even really hit with anybody at this yeah. point but I do remember yeah the whole Naomi Campbell thing mm. really sort of lifted it for us I mean obviously it's Everybody's on board with it now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. anybody, everybody's buying it. And, and what would you say are sort of career highlights? Can you think of a, you know, a particular campaign or a particular brand that you're sort of proudest of working? Um, 
It's so difficult. It's hard, right? It's a really difficult one. Is that I'm even 25 years down the line of doing this, I still get so excited all the time. I'm thinking, everyone's always, you know, God, he's, he's so easily pleased, Dan. He still gets so excited <laughs> about everything. I still see. It's a nice quality. You know, I, I still see. You still get pleasure print. out of it. And uh, I, excitement, I think yeah. see things in print. I see people putting stuff on Instagram, mm. and it still gives me that warm, fuzzy feeling that mm. we had a part in that. And I think this is also what goes back to one of the, the sort of fundamentals of when uh, when I first started PR. And one of the things that Michael always told me is that you always have to say thank you to everybody that mm. does anything for you. Nobody has to do anything for us. We're not paying anybody to write about the products. So they don't have to. So always make sure that you always thank people. Yeah. So I'm always searching for press coverage, which annoys my friends. In, in this, <laughs> that, it always is that you're always online. You're always da 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 da. You know, you're never focusing. You're always scrolling. Yeah, and and I'm always looking because I always want to make sure that I don't miss anything because I always have to say thank you yeah. to something. And I think it's such a it's a nice trait to have. Is that it definitely is. you know people people continue working for you know. It's a human nature thing. So people like to be appreciated, and yeah, I think it. But it's all part and parcel, as you say, of of that the qualities that you have as a a PR, where you want to engender, you know, people feeling good about the work that they've done, and 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 it's appreciated, yeah. and therefore people want to keep everyone, working with you, and everyone loves it. Pat on the back. Of course they do. Of course they do. Never hear enough of it, but uh, um, but yeah. But going back to what are my career highlights? Career highlights. Career highlights. So. Like I said, I've worked across so many different areas to the things that we've done have been insane. Mm. Again, we, I think a lot of people forget in this industry as well, just how fortunate we are. Yeah. Is that we put a lot of time in and a lot of effort and we get to work with some of the most incredible minds in the world, you know, some of the most incredible noses in the mm. world. People with insane that have brought their ideas to fruition and we are along for the ride a lot of the time. So we get, you know, lovely treats all the time. We get to try things and have things before they're out on the market. But you get to go to great places. I mean, I've been flown all over the world mm. to do launches, to meet people, and you never, never take it for granted. So all of that, I love all of that about yeah. our job. But when it comes to doing like huge launches and you get to be really, really creative. I mean, I've done wild things like we've I hired the Tower of London at one point. What? And yeah, it hired the Tower of London. I had the complete the white, with beef eaters and uh, all of it. <laughs> the white <laughs> tower and we projected the fragrance brand name across the outside of the Tower of London. Wow. We had a private viewing of the the crown jewels. Amazing. I've done launches at the top of the gherkin when the gherkin first when it was brand new. When it was brand yeah. new, um, at the top of the gherkin, I did. We did a huge event last year. I created a mini festival at the top of um, the Treehouse Hotel uh, oh, in okay, London. Yeah. Um, we did a mini festival. Had singers, artists. I mean, it was a whole day event. We had a queue around the block. Yeah. And um, and going outside and seeing 300 people queuing up to come to our event. It just, I mean, it just, I was so I mean, like, super, was, super proud. Yeah, but I love the fact that there's still, it's interesting that, you know, the, the, two, the two different things you cited are, you know, different stages of your career, but it's lovely to hear that you're still enthused and, yeah. and that the highlights are coming just thick and fast now, just as much as they did oh, a long time ago. Absolutely. So that's, and that you're still into what you do. Oh, I mean, and the highlights don't come, with, come on their own, you know. There's always the low points as well. Yeah, and a lot I mean, of work. I've had uh, some disasters over the years. I mean, for one, we were doing... This is going back a long, long time, but it taught me a big lesson in that never plan on anything that has an element that's slightly out of your control. <laughs> it um, wasn't children or animals, was it? <laughs> no, but we hired what was to be the world's tallest tall ship Right. To ever sail down the Thames, um, it was for a big watch launch, and it was uh, uh, you know, nautical watches. So there was the whole boat connection was right. great, and it was all good, and we were all ready for it. And the day before it arrived in London, it was chartered, came over from Australia, and it sank. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it sank. Jake got caught in a storm and it sank just outside. Um, Plans literally scuppered. Yeah, uh, and I got a phone call to say, sorry, your boat has sunk. <laughs> you know that boat you were going <laughs> to... That boat that was going to be amazing sank and so yeah we had to scrap all those plans very very quickly so yeah lesson learned if you have to rely on something else yeah for something as big as you know a big launch have a backup yeah always have a backup <laughs> plan or just don't do it <laughs> just don't do it pick a static venue yeah i've learned that one well look we'll we'll return to, to talk more about pr for for sure but um I loved and and it's great because we're in person and I can see products in front of me, which is which is amazing. But yeah, one of the the themes of the Man in the Mirror podcast is to to ask the guest about some of the key bathroom essentials, those those items that they can't do without in their morning and evening rituals. It'd be great, Dan, if you'd tell me about some of yours. In, in terms of um, skincare, what what are your sort of hero items? Okay, so I had to really, I like. As well as being in PR, you know, you 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 get the opportunity to try out yeah. a lot of different yeah, things. Yeah. But I am basically a marketer's dream. I am the holy grail of what we all search for in this industry. Is that when I find something that I like, I never move away <laughs> yeah, from yeah. it. Call that brand loyalty or laziness. Um, <laughs> you decide. Yeah, be it what it may. But yeah, I find my things and I stick with them. So I think one of the key, and again, this goes back to years ago, in that when I was growing up, I always looked really, really young. Yeah. And I had real issues with it. And It's good now, though, isn't it, having a young face, don't you think? Well, do we still think it's... Yes. Yeah, yes. thank you. But um, yeah, I was always... People never... I always felt that people never took me seriously mm. because I looked young. So... I had no intention of using skin creams or anything. <laughs> you didn't want to make to it be, better. No, I was going to retain that youthful <laughs> glow and chubby cheek looking. So I... You were like of, painting on stubble. Uh, with <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, yeah, I, I just didn't do anything. And I think, you know, the top tip now, obviously, is, you know, anyone listening is speaking, you will eventually get to 40 yeah. and you will eventually see those lines yeah. that you could have sort of prevented back in the days so I wish I had started I'm, yeah I'm on catch up now as well no, yeah, I don't it, think it's it going to work but. it does feel a bit like catch up is everything has an SPF in it now late with my homework yeah, yeah. so so skincare then skincare is that I've always used Kiehl's yeah I just find love it my, my skin I think growing up on the farm is that I have uh, tough skin mm -hmm. um, so you can pretty much my body is a, a contradiction, and my, my skin is or is a contradiction in itself. Is that on my face you can put absolutely anything, and you know use the harshest of of scrubs, mm. and it's great. It's all good. As soon as I use uh, sort of a perfumed anything on on the rest of my body, I'll get like an extra rash. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah. It's, Did you have eczema as a child? No, or just dry skin. Sensitive not, skin. Not, yes, yeah, sensitive skin. I feel from the neck down, I'm extremely sensitive. <laughs> from the, the neck up, you know, you can you use the harshest... Have that in tombstone, maybe it's good. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I've always so you've got facial fuel there. Facial fuel by, by Kiehl's as a skin sort of exfoliator. And then always, uh, again, keeping with the, the trend of Kiehl's, facial fuel... A moisturizer mm -hmm. with SPF 19 now. Yep. Um, so I use those Great. every day. Um, probably not the scrub every day, but at least twice. And a I week. see some ordinary, the I, ordinary yeah, products and uh, ordinary I products. Also, you know, reading, reading all the reviews and being. Marketed. It's a big old brand, isn't it? Now the ordinary. Yeah, it's. I suddenly thought. We're trying to turn back the clock here now. <laughs> We're trying, or at least hang on to these years. So hyaluronic acid yep. every day, yep. twice a day if I can remember. <laughs> I might be overdoing it, but, you know, I'm really trying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I also use the glycolic acid toning solution as well before bed. And I do feel like it really sort of brightens my skin. Yeah, you're noticing the effect. No, no, I have noticed it yet. So, I mean, I will... I will keep trying these. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying all and everything that's out there on the market, but I think I found these two things. Yeah. And they're really great prices as well. They are, aren't they? I you mean, are really... Audrey are really good with them. When you price. look at some of the other products in that category doing that job, it does seem really well priced. Yeah. yeah. So I, you 
And what about hair, Dan? Hair, I've always just used like a you know, run-of-the-mill VO5 texturising gum. I think... I it works, was, though. I, well, I also always had issues with my hair as well. Yeah. One, I'm one of those people that is cursed with both a cow's lick and a double, you know, double, double crown. Um, so my hair wants to go all, all and everywhere. Yeah. It doesn't want to play ball. But I also never really knew what... What the right thing to yeah, well, what, style, yeah. Yeah, what is my hairstyle? You know, you work in PR, you're meant to be cool and this and the other, but I've never gone for that. So I think I, I found a hairstyle. Yeah, you found a style that works. That works, and I've stuck with it yeah. for, for 25 <laughs> years. I think, again, I also went sort of grey quite early on. Yeah. Which, again, I didn't have issues with that because it made me look yeah, like I was yeah, yeah. Going, going a bit older. Yeah. Um, so I was like, yes, I'm really, I need to embrace that. But you know, that sort of salt and pepper went round the sides. But I also ended up getting a melon streak at the front of my hair. So yeah. the front of my hair has this sort of a very sort of grey white stripe, which if I've washed my hair, it's very bold. Is it? It's very bold. And and I go sort of to meetings and everyone's like, have you dyed your hair? <laughs> and I, then I just know that people think I'm trying to do yeah. something. So a little bit of wax, it sort of darkens it yeah, down yeah. a bit and you don't notice it so much. But um And yeah. and obviously, you know, working with the brands you do and, and being involved in fragrance, I've no doubt you're you know, you've got so many products at your fingertips. But do you what's your relationship with fragrance on a daily basis? I mean, do you choose you have you got a sort of certain signature one or do you choose by mood or, or find yourself going to the same one over and over? Well, you know, we all have a fragrance wardrobe. We know? do. We all so, have our fragrance wardrobe, but we do have our favourites. Like children. No, yeah. not like that. <laughs> no. <laughs> like our dogs. Like our dogs. Um, yeah. And yeah, and I, again, I have, you know, I could I could sit there and think, I was, when I was sort of thinking about what I use for this podcast, is I was sitting there thinking about, I can plot my life along in fragrance. I know exactly what I wore yeah. at every stage in my life, yeah. and I'm sure yeah, it's probably yeah. the same. That's one of the great things about it, isn't it? Yeah. You can place the... yourself in different times yeah. by what you wore, yeah. From CK1 to, you know, Aqua de Geo. Yeah. Cool water. Oh, was, I didn't go into cool, go cool water. I didn't go into cool water. I think my dad had cool water. <laughs> oh. uh, you know, T&G and, and all of this. So I, and, but once I got into... It, you know, once we started working and then I was spoiled from the word go. Mm. With our fragrances, yeah. were, my fragrances were Creed yeah. instantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then from there we worked with, and again, we worked with Creed, Frederick Marle and Byredo. Wow. So that was my initial first real introduction to this fragrance world. And I mean, once you've had those brands, you yeah. are spoiled. You're you can't spoiled go for back. life. So what did you go for today? So my current fra- favourite that I have been wearing for quite some time. For day, I have worn for many years now Juice Box Micro Love. Oh, I love. I just brand. love it. It's fresh and I love the music connection as well. And the, yeah, yeah, it's got that very cool music connection. But I just think what they do and how they interpret the the music into fragrances is, is just genius. Yeah, yeah, it's so cool. And you know, I love everything about their bottles and this and the other. But the fragrance. When I spray it, it feels me. Yeah. It feels so yeah, me. Yeah, Everybody yeah. around me knows as soon as I turn up that that's that kind of fragrance. Signature. And if they smell it, it's it's me. Yeah. Whether or not that's a bad, good or bad thing for all those people. <laughs> and, He's here. Yeah. And then, but a couple of, sort of year or so ago, um, another brand that we work with now as well, uh, called DS and Durga, launched their fragrance, St. Vetiver. And I could just douse myself in that. Correct. I bathe in St. Vetiver all and every day. It is the most... Oh, smell that. It is the most oh, yeah. delicious. It's sort of, it wasn't this idea of sort of piratey kind of tropical island. Yeah, yeah. boozy, yeah. vetiver sort of uh, scent. And I, I just love it. It's it's grown up, yeah. but still a bit fun. Yeah, um, and it's, it's distinct, isn't it? It's, it's not like... It's distinct. You're it certainly not going to find everyone wearing it. yeah. Um, yeah, it's really and good. so, yeah, those are what I've been wearing for the past year. So, like I said, I find something I love. Yeah, I and really you stick with do it. stick with it. Yeah. But I do, you know, I we have so many fragrances in in our office, and I, I'll dip in and out. Yeah, and, you know, and you're going to have to trial 
different things just to be able to yeah. talk about it, presumably. Yeah, and, you know, you sit down with the perfumer and they yeah. talk you through everything. And yeah, yeah. Get really, it's, it's so amazing just entering into their world and talking through those fragrances. And when you sat with a perfumer who's made a fragrance, you get something so different from it so, than just sitting on your own yeah. and smelling it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I will be, no doubt, wearing uh, it's Pistachio by D.S. and Durga. I'm wearing Pistachio oh, today, on? yeah. yeah. Um, I was, in an event, I was at an event with um, which Dan organised last week, actually, with um, David Seth Maltz, who is another friend of the podcast who was on last season. Um, but, uh, yeah, Dan does the, the PR for D.S. and Durga. He, um, David was over doing an event hosted by the lovely Susie Nightingale. And, um, yeah, he was talking about some of the new things that were happening this year, one of which was pistachio, which is seems to be a real hit, and I'm certainly seeing it, you know, written about quite a lot at the moment and people are loving because it's got that sort of obviously you know, the name suggests it's got that sort of gourmand quality but it's not it's not an over sweet no. sort of sugary thing it's a, there's a bit more sophistication a bit of some dryness to it and there's a bit of patchouli in there isn't it it's yeah so great. it's a gourmand done in a ds and yeah. way yeah yeah exactly. and which again that's a, a couple of years ago we would never have as as guys never been allowed to wear really a gourmand scent it yeah. would have been very much considered a woman's fragrance. Yeah, yeah. And this is why I think it's so exciting about things now is that it's for everyone. Fragrance is for everybody. Yeah. It's completely genderless. Wear whatever you want. You yeah. want to, you wake up, you want to wear a rose fragrance, wear a rose fragrance. Do it. You know, there, uh, there's brands out there that will do it in a more feminine way. But mm. There's, you know, like DS and Durga do their rose fragrances and they are done in a DS and Durga way. Yeah. It's not sort of dirtied up somehow, yeah. given a bit of an yeah, edge. So yeah. You find those yeah. those bits for you. Yeah. I was really great to find out about um, some of the products that are important to you. I was just heading back to PR. I mean, I I imagine it's changed a lot in the last few years, where, where at one point it would be all focused on journalists. I've certainly seen it now in, you know, in my interactions with, with PRs. There's, there's this whole new world that's opened up in the last 10 years or so, obviously with, with, with social media, but a kind of a whole role that's come out of that is the sort of influencer thing. And I guess for a PR, that's a sector that you have to engage with and embrace. How, how has it yeah. changed things? It's it's changed a lot. Um, I mean, the fundamentals of what we do are still the same. Mm. It's still about communication. Um, so you you would have to, if, if you had a certain brand, and again, I guess it would depend on you know who the brand is and how how they wanted to do it, but you 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 would have to engage with the the online and influencer community and find yeah. the right ones for a brand. Absolutely, I think it happened. Oh well, if I think back, I remember the day going back. I can't remember how many years was now when I would always be, I would be working at London Fashion Week and going into the fashion shows and seeing the front rows and everyone, you know, you always knew that it would be certain people like the from all the different fashion magazines. magazines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You always had your Susie Menkes, yeah, you, know, you know, Anna Winters and you know, all of the big guns from mm. the world of fashion all sitting on those front rows. And it wasn't that they obviously disappeared, but suddenly you started to new people too. these new people sort yeah. of dotted in around them and they weren't from print press mm. uh, so that was strange and but then behind the scenes as well as going into the shows I always sat um, sorry I would always be working on the what was called the stands at London Fashion Week and it was more sort of the trade showy side of yeah. it and every year you would start to see these these people that just turned up with their cameras and yeah, started sort of filming themselves, filming themselves, <laughs> yeah. uh, inter wanting to really interact with your product, um, yeah. but filming it on themselves. And you journalists were never like that. They always, you know, came and they they looked at product, but they was never you know, taking pictures of themselves. And and so you suddenly sort of started seeing yeah. all of this, and it just year on year it just started growing and growing. And there was always that. You know, there was a snobbery around it to start. Yeah. Um, people... You think that's gone now? I mean, I... Oh, I think... Yes and no. Yeah. I think people are now appreciating the level of work that goes into yeah. what a lot of influencers do. Obviously, you know, I get phone calls from people who have said, I'm an influencer, and they've got 
200 followers on following Instagram them. and they're just taking, <laughs> you know, just snaps at home. And that's great. And it is, you know, you... It's, uh, everybody is allowed to... And you start somewhere. ...interact yeah. with, with your brand. And mm. I love the fact that people mm. are putting the effort in. Mm. But we had... It, it, from when we first started, and there was almost... It sounds bad now, but slightly scattered an approach as we were sort mm. of we were finding our way of course. through this new world. We always knew that we wanted to be in Vogue and Harper's and and it, and all of the prim press. We always knew our where we wanted to be positioned. But you had to start learning about this new world of the, of the influencers, mm. the bloggers, and the vloggers. And so. Over the, the over time, we've had to hone our craft, yeah. our new craft. Because uh, it's like, I mean, it goes without saying, but you know, you'd have your certain database, I'd imagine, in in the in the magazines and even even websites. But it must be sort of thousands, tens of thousands more people to to, to consider, oh. and you've got to be tracking yeah. you know, who's got the most followers and all that stuff. Quite, quite yeah, a big and, undertaking. And even you know the the, the changes in. In the people that we're uh, approaching, you know, the, at one point it was whoever had the, the the most followers was great, yeah. and now it's not about just who has the most. It's you have to be more select and find the ones that are most brand appropriate for yeah. you, the ones that are going. Because it's not a one size fits all. No, things. to that will reflect and um, that that can work with your brand correctly. That, and deliver um, what and the brand wants. And deliver what wants. the brand wants. Yeah. And then there is that, that synergy between them. So there there is so much more that goes into it now than just yeah. putting something in an envelope and yeah. Yeah. Out and waiting for the transparency. Take, yeah, <laughs> waiting for somebody to take a picture. And I suppose, you know, from a, from a sort of purely commercial point of view, you can totally understand, you know, the end goal for a brand is, you know, to either, like you, like you say, have, have the right people appreciating or seeing posts about their product but actually if if an influencer's got it's mathematics isn't it if an influencer's got hundreds of thousands of followers and can do a post and say great things about a brand i mean may in some ways you can see why that's as appealing if not more so than some of the magazines which it is you know i don't it, I, it is you can sort of you know you but you have to think about those algorithms you know you have to take into consideration all those algorithms they might have huge followers but are those people seeing it? Yeah. Who are those people? And but uh, no, I, t I take that point. And but are I the guess, right people seeing it? Yeah. But say, ima imagine it, it is someone who's very, you know, right for the brand and has lots of followers and gets good engagement for their posts. You, I, I just say, from from a brand point of view, there's no downside if if the influencer's doing, you know, the post that they've, they've been asked to do and it, and it works and it connects because people then are suddenly online and able to yeah. purchase no I, I, yeah it's just i guess it's an interesting world where you know ultimately for the brand they want to sell product and, and have this hangout yeah. effect of good things happening. i think what's exciting is that it's really expanded what we do yeah. um it's really opened up a whole new demographic of of people to be able to market to. Um, so you mean like young, younger people? Yeah, younger people. Um, but, you know, not just the readers of GQ magazine, yeah. for instance. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, you're not just marketing to that one person who's picked up that magazine. You're you're marketing to a, a huge, wider audience, and also where they live in the country. You mm. you can sort of, you know, geographically target sometimes. Mm. Who who you're marketing to? So you have a new store launch. You you can pick influencers like you would go yeah. on to the local newspaper. Yeah, back yeah. In that in the, back in the day. Yeah, there's people um, who are also well known in their in region. The, in those yeah. regions, yeah. and that is really exciting. But but it's a lot of work. Okay. It's a lot. It's a lot of work. <laughs> a lot of people to keep tabs on. A lot of people to keep tabs on. A lot of spreadsheets. A lot of names and addresses. <laughs> but it's fun. You know. Yeah. It's it's great. Yeah, it's interesting. So something else I like to to do on Man in the Mirror, as the name suggests, is is find out the guests' sort of relationship with their self image and and what they see when they look in the mirror. So I I, I wonder for you, you know, you're in your early forties. You know, how comfortable are you with your appearance now when you when you see Dan back in in the mirror in the mo morning and evening? Are, are you are you someone who's you know very happy with where you are now, or do you do you think oh you know, there was a different stage where I was... I don't know, what, what do you think about what um, you see? 
It's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Is yeah. that um, sorry? <laughs> like I was, like I said, I was when I was good, sort of younger, and I just always looked really young. Yeah, sort of happy with how you know, happy with how I looked. But then I was unhappy with how I looked when it comes to a work situation. Yeah, so because I, you th- the, perhaps people didn't take you seriously. Yeah, I felt like people didn't take me seriously. Like, you know, look like a baby. <laughs> um, but now, as I've got older, I'm also. I know it sounds so cliche to say it but it comes with confidence and, yeah. um that you care a bit less about what other people think yeah, yeah. so much because i know that i can hold my own in any situation yeah. i don't need to somebody to look at me and validation say, from you're a certain yeah. age or you yeah. look a certain way so i'm going to take you seriously and i think you've you know in uh, anybody in their 30s 40s is uh, the right you know you're absolutely an adult and you can hold a re- you know we're all in yeah but maybe in jobs where there's a certain amount of responsibility yeah i think i th- almost think also it might sound a bit, you know, sort of up my own, but I think I think I've sort of grown into my looks as well. Mm. And that I'm happy with how when I look in the mirror, how I look. Don't get me wrong; there's always going to be things that we all want to change. Yeah, came out of pandemic a bit heavier than I was, <laughs> and and now me that too. shows it shows on my face. But a little bit of stubble can give you can contour. <laughs> it's, you know, I'm not sitting around contouring with makeup, but a little bit of stubble can yeah. hide, uh, you know. And would you ever consider, otherwise... are you someone that would ever think about doing treatments, tweakments, anything? Is that in your sort of frame of reference or is that not for you? I'm never going to say never. Never if say it, never. If I, if I wanted to, I would. You're not adverse. Go. I'm not adverse. I, and... Uh, Go for whatever makes you happy. Yeah. So if you come back, you know, if we have this chat in a couple of years' time and I've got massive, great, big, huge <laughs> lips, don't judge me, Hayden. It was no, my own choice. There's no judgment. It's yeah. what makes me happy. You do you, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> and and finally, what are the things that make you happy? What are the things that make me happy? And this probably sounds really sickening, but if you ask anybody that knows me, I am generally a very upbeat and happy person I feel like I've got to 44 and I have achieved a lot Yeah, I have a great job that I really really love and that, that I, makes me happy every yeah. day and um, that you're in control of I guess that I'm in control thing. of yeah. you yeah. don't answer to anyone which must feel nice answer to anybody profile <laughs> from all, of, all, all of our brands and every single <laughs> press person That's and influencer true. out true. there but I have got lots of know, bosses then actually but, have lots of bosses but I have really <laughs> This is another thing that Michael always taught me as well, is only work with brands that make you happy or Mm. work with people that make you happy because we spend a ridiculous amount of our time at work and if I have to just field calls that from people that aren't nice to me, Mm. that's going to make me really unhappy. Yeah. And I don't, you know, so, look, like I said, I'm still with the same person for 25 years, so that makes me happy. My home life... It all sounds a bit idealist, uh, idyllic, doesn't it? But no, I am, you know, that a happy home life, and I really, really love my job. So, well, that's amazing. But you, but you, you know, it is interesting, isn't it? Because I'm you know, thinking about some people in my life. There's there's people who maybe it sounds ridiculous, but you can make choices to look at life in a sort of positive and a and a happy way. Do you know? Or there's this, or, and conversely, there's people who seem to see the misery and the, yeah. ha- where a rain cloud follows them. And I, I know Dan a little bit and I've been lucky enough to, you know, interact with him because of um, doing some writing and going to some of his events and and he's kindly set up some of the, a couple of the previous guests that have been on the podcast actually through through some of his brands. But yeah, I can attest that he's definitely a very, you know, always very easy to deal with and, and upbeat and, and positive person. And it does... It helps, doesn't it? It kind of just sort of helps to kind of smooth things along, and and you know, it, it must. It sounds very obvious, but you know, we we like to deal with people that we like, and yeah. I, it's good Absolutely. to hear that that's your ethos in terms of clients and things as well. And it in it makes definitely makes the world go round and make things easier, doesn't it? When we enjoy people's company yeah. and all of that, like you say, it's about connections. Yeah, and that I think at the end of the day is it goes back to I was. It's all about communication. Well, Dan, thank you so much for, for having me. Um, really appreciate your your time and, and sharing your office space with, with me this morning. It's really interesting to 
to hear about your your story and 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 to find out a little bit more insight about PR and where it's at now, and of course to find out about some of your key products that you use. Um, really appreciate it, and no, you're very uh, uh, welcome. really enjoy working with you anyway. But um, I'm so happy that you did this, and I hope it's proved interesting to people out there. But uh, thanks, Dan. See you soon. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I went along to the profile office to record this a couple of months ago and Dan was such a a warm and engaging interviewee. I love spending time with him. He, he's great fun. And there's been so much change, I think, in that, that PR industry over the last 15 years or so. And obviously the, you know, the rise of social media and, and influencer marketing has, has made the job really different and, and varied. So I, I hope you enjoyed that and, and took something from it. You can find Profile PR on Instagram there, at Profile PR, so P-R-O-F-I-L-E-P-R, all one word, and ProfilePublicRelations.com on the web. If you want to find out more about Man in the Mirror, I'm at Man in the Mirror Pod on Instagram, and you'll find information about previous guests, previous episodes, and I'll tease and preview things that are coming up in future weeks because, yeah, we've got some great guests coming up in season four. So thanks for listening. Thanks for sticking around on, on this episode. My thanks to Dan Williams from Profile. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time on Man in the Mirror. Take care. 